All right. Peace to you and praise the Lord. We are still in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. And we're going to continue in verse 14 until the end of the chapter. May the Lord bless the reading of this holy word. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. There are a few things that... <clears throat> this passage of scripture is very, very basic. It's a vision. It's, it's an allegory. It's something that is uh, like in the, in the manner of a parable. But yet it's very simple. And there are just a few things that I want to bring to your attention as I'm reading it. Those of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ, these things are going to be very basic to you, and they're probably going to sharpen you a little, I hope. And those of you who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, these things are going to seem kind of shocking to you. But this is what the scripture says. Okay. First of all, I want to bring to your attention, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. This means what it says. Okay. I'm not one of those who will take um, Greek and Hebrew words that you don't understand and try to twist them around to try to convince you that the Word of God doesn't really mean what it says, but that it actually should have been translated another way. That's witchcraft. It's called theology, and it's perversion. Theology is witchcraft. Okay, Theology is the perversion of the Word of God. It's, it's the use of the pretended knowledge of foreign languages to pervert the meaning of the Word of God and cause people to misunderstand the Word of God, to cause people to believe that the Word of God has been incorrectly translated so that, that these lying teachers can translate it another way to teach another doctrine. That's what theology is, okay, pure and simple. I'm not into that. I'm a Christian. I'm a priest. Okay, You're a priest? Yes, I am. We're all part of a royal priesthood if we're in the body of Christ. We are a royal priesthood, a chosen nation, a peculiar people. <coughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Okay. I've talked to people before who, who read this passage of Scripture, and they said, well, they thought at first that this was Jesus, but it can't be Jesus because an angel spoke to him, telling him to do something. Because it says, another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, then you understand perfectly that for a, a holy angel in a vision to come to him and tell him that the time has come for him to reap, it's not at all an unusual thing. It's not an inordinate thing. It's not a subordinate thing. It is a thing that is very natural for the kingdom of God, if you'll pardon my use of the word natural, but very um, easy to believe, very ordinary about the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is the Son of Man. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, is the Son of Man. What is the Son of Man? A human being, a man born of a woman. Why is the Son of God called the Son of God? Because he's the son of God. Because God has a son. He put his seed in the womb of a woman and brought forth a son. This woman brought forth a son. What's the meaning of the word son? A male child. That's what a son is. The son of God is a male child who was brought forth from the womb of a, of a virgin, a woman. And his father is God and his mother is a woman. Therefore, he is the son of God because God is his father. God is a spirit, not a man. Okay. The Bible says that God is a spirit. The Bible also says that God is not a man. The Bible says both of those things very clearly. God is a spirit, John 4.24. God is not a man, Numbers 23.19. Okay. God is not a man. God is a spirit. These things the Bible says very clearly. So we know that God is not a man. But we know that the Son of God is a man. Because the Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5, among many other places. The scripture makes very clear that the Son of God is a man. The Son of God is not another God or a part of a trinity of gods. He is a man. And in him, in that man, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What is the Godhead? It is God the Father. Godhead is a singular noun that means the deity. When you see the word Godhead in the scripture, it's referring to God the Father, the Almighty God, the deity. 
There's only one deity. That's God the Father. There's only one God. It's God the Father. There's no other God. There is no God called God the Son, and there is no God called God the Holy Spirit. There are no such gods in the Holy Bible anywhere as God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. Those are made-up gods that have nothing to do with the Bible or Christianity or Jesus Christ. So, having said that, John said, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Okay? He didn't say, On the cloud one sat like unto the Almighty God. He said, One sat like unto the Son of Man. When you see the phrase, the Son of Man, most often in the Scripture it's referring to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is not only the Son of Man, but also the Son of God. Why is he called the Son of Man? Because his mother was a woman. Okay? She is part of man, mankind. So he's the son of mankind because his mother was a human, and he's the son of God because his father is God. He's the son of God and the son of man. That's why he's called that. So, I looked and behold a white cloud, John said, and, and on the cloud, and upon the cloud, one sat like unto the son of man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the resurrected Christ. Okay, and this is a vision that John saw. Okay, just like the vision of the dragon and the vision of the woman uh, in chapter 12 that was giving birth in heaven, it's not something that is, was literal. It's something that was a vision given to him so that he could understand things that were about to come to pass. This is the same way. John is being given a vision, and he sees on this cloud one like unto the Son of Man, who is Jesus Christ. He's, the same thing is it's written in the first chapter of the Revelation. Um and in Revelation 1.13, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Okay, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Son of God. Okay, this is who it is, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. Why do we think it's such a strange thing for an angel to come to the Son of Man and say, Thrust in thy sickle and reap? He's not usurping authority over the Son of Man. He is making a, he's proclaiming a joyful message to the Son of Man, God's holy and righteous servant. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, is the servant of God. God called him my righteous servant. Okay? When Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, he said, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God, is a servant of the living God. Okay? In him dwelleth all the, godness, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, of a truth. And he is the Almighty God in the flesh. But he is at the same time a man, the servant of the living God. And as a servant of the living God, angels minister to him. And this particular angel came ministering to him, saying, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. The time has come for thee to reap, Jesus of Nazareth, you who gave your life on the cross for the sins of the world and endured the shame and the spitting and the pulling out of your beard and the whipping of your back and waited patiently knowing the joy that was set before you and endured the cross despising the shame. The time has come for thee to reap. It is a joyous and a wonderful thing. The time has come. The time has come. Thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe, and he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Okay. What is it that was reaped? If we go back to the seventh chapter of the Revelation, again, we can see in verse 9, after the first eight verses of John seeing those 144,000 that were sealed in their foreheads, it says in verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And eventually an angel asked John who these are. And John said, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, I'm reading in verse 14, chapter 7, verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. 
For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Praise the Lord. These are those ones. When the angel said to the Son of Man in this vision, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. For the, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Those are the ones that are going to be reaped at that time. Those multitudes on the earth during the time of the Great Tribulation who will have heard and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ and made their, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. At least mostly due, if not totally due, to those 144,000 who were sealed and who preached the gospel during that time. So the 144,000, as we spoke of before, are not the bride, they are the virgins. And when the 144,000 are sealed and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, there will be multitudes on the earth of all nations and kindreds and, and, kindreds and tongues and people who will have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made themselves white. These are the guests, the wedding guests. And now we see from this vision that Jesus, the Son of Man, is going to reap them. And when he does that, when he thrusts in his sickle to reap, and the wedding guests will be caught up into heaven, and the wedding will begin. And then, verse 16, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Okay, so now this isn't the Son of Man. This is an angel, another angel. Okay, the first angel was the one that spoke to the Son of Man. Now there's another angel. And another angel came out from the altar, another angel yet, came out from the altar, which had power over fire. Okay, so now another angel has come out and stood on a cloud. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire. Okay, what happens on the altar? Things get burned. So this angel came out from the altar, and he had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle. Now remember, he's not talking to the Son of Man. He's talking to this other angel who had a sharp sickle as well. Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now I could preach a sermon on this verse of Scripture, this one verse of Scripture, for probably an hour or two. <clears throat> but you get the idea. This angel is going to thrust in his sharp sickle and gather the vine of the clusters of the vine of the earth, for they are fully ripe. Remember when God spoke to Abraham and he, he spoke to them about the Canaanites and he said that their, their iniquity was not yet full. But 400 years later, God brought judgment upon the Canaanites. He gave them time. He gave them space to repent. And instead, all they did was increase their iniquity. And when the time came that his judgment came down, it was just. It would have been just in the first place, but it was even more just because God gave them space to repent even though they didn't deserve that. Well, her grapes are fully ripe, the scripture says in verse 18. Revelation 14, 18, her grapes are fully ripe. Sometimes when I'm on my knees praying to the Lord and seeing the things that have happened that I see in the world when I go outside in the world, thank God that I have an apartment to come into and shut the door and leave the world outside. I don't know why anybody would want television in their house. The last thing that I want when I come in my door and shut the world and leave the world outside is to drag part of it into my house again with Hollywood and cable TV and all that perverted garbage that people actually pay their money for. When I am out in the world, it is a grievous thing. And the only joyous thing about it is being able to share the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I come into my house and shut the door, it's so awesome to be able to be here, inside my house, with the world shut out and have peace here. Praise the Lord. But the world outside is terrible and awful and it's wicked and perverted. And people out there are proclaiming everything that is wrong is right. And, and they're proclaiming that darkness is light and truth is error. And sometimes when I kneel before the Lord, I say to him, Lord, how much worse could it get? How could thy wrath be not already upon this evil nation and upon this evil world? But his patience is so great and his long suffering is so great. But the time is coming when that judgment that he has prolonged for so long will come. And at that time, the scripture says, her grapes are fully ripe. You know, you don't pick grapes for wine. 
when they're not ripe yet. You wait until they're fully ripe, until they're fully full of juice, and you're going to just, as soon as you crush it, it's just going to splatter with juice everywhere and ready to make the wine with. Well, God is waiting for that time. And during the time that he's waiting, you have time to repent and turn from your wicked ways and be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And if you reject that, when the time has come that your grapes are fully ripe, God will come and he'll send this judgment. I'm going to read verse 18 again, verses 17 and 18. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that sat, excuse me, to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Notice he didn't say reap. When you reap, you're pulling something out of the field in order to use it for consumption. But he didn't say that. He said, Thrust in thy sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Gather them for what? And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. The feet of the righteous shall be stained with the blood of the wicked. Those of us who are righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ will stain our feet with the blood of the wicked. If you are among the wicked and you mock the living God and you have mocked me and you have mocked my brethren, the time will come when your blood will be splattered all over our garments and all over our feet. And the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, first and foremost, will know the joy of trampling through your blood, wallowing in the destruction of your soul because of your rejection of his love and of the truth and of the sacrifice that he made for you. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. A winepress is a stone pit where the grapes were cast in and then people would go in barefoot and stomp on the grapes and cause the juice to come out of the grapes and it was a multi-level thing so that the juice would come out and run down into another reservoir to be treated so that people could drink it. You, who are the wicked of the earth, if you're not a Christian, if you're not abiding in Jesus Christ, even if you are a Christian, if you're not abiding in Jesus Christ, this is what is reserved for you. The angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. This is what's going to happen as soon as the last of the people of this earth who are invited to the wedding will come to the wedding. The bride will have already been there, and then the virgins will come next, and then the guests, the wedding guests, which we just spoke about which the Son of Man cast in his sickle into the earth and reaped. And once that happens, the judgment of God is going to come upon the wicked of this earth. And there will be no more opportunity for anybody to say, I'm sorry, I'll serve you. Verse 20, And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress. We don't hear anything, we don't see anything in the scripture about Jesus looking into the winepress and saving any of the people that are in the winepress. Or any of the people in the winepress going, I'm sorry, I repent and the Lord having mercy upon them. There's nothing like that in the scripture anywhere. When you're cast into the winepress, you're done. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. A thousand six hundred furlongs is two hundred miles. <clears throat> and the scripture reveals elsewhere that this is going to take place in the valley of Armageddon which is outside of Jerusalem, where the armies of the world are going to actually gather together against the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he appears from heaven on a white horse coming to take his kingdom. The people in their darkened minds, the people of this world in their darkened minds, the people who believe that men can marry men, women can marry women, babies are not babies, um, drugs are okay, um, all the things that people believe, that the perverted things that they believe, that darkness is light and light is darkness, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter, all this darkened, fooled mob is going to actually gather together against the King of Kings. They're going to see him coming in the clouds of heaven on a white horse, and they're going to gather together their tanks and their guns and their little, their little foolish weapons, their little impotent weapons, and gather themselves together to fight against the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I can't imagine a more stupid, foolish, prideful act than that. I mean, I can imagine some of the people, the darkened people that I see in this world every day denying the Lord Jesus Christ, even though it's a stupid thing to do. 
because you have to purposely not see the evidence that's in front of you in order to be able to convince yourself that Jesus Christ isn't who he said he is. But even in a sense, I can see that. But to see him coming in the clouds of heaven, and at that point, not bowing down and saying, oh, what a fool I have been, I repent. But not doing that, but gathering up weapons and gathering up all your friends and calling all your friends and saying, come on, let's go to war against the king of kings. He's coming in the clouds of heaven. That's the pinnacle of stupidity. That's the pinnacle of prideful foolishness. That is the pinnacle of ignorance. And that's what's going to happen in the valley of Armageddon outside of Jerusalem. On that day in the valley of decision, as Joel talked about, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Thither the Lord shall cause his mighty ones to come down. And for 200 miles, as high as a horse's bridle, on me a horse's bridle is about up to my chin. So about five feet high, for 200 miles, will be nothing but blood, dead bodies. Even as the scripture says of the Lord Jesus many times. I'm thinking of a particular verse in the 110th Psalm. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. That's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. And guess what? There's going to be a sword in my hand on that day, and I'm going to be riding right behind him. And we are going to rejoice in the destruction of the wicked. And we're going to splatter our garments with the blood of the wicked. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So in Revelation chapter 14, just to kind of sum up, in the first 13 verses, we see this vision of the 140 and 4,000 that are virgins. And then these three different angels preaching. One was preaching the gospel to the nations in, in the hope that some few of them might believe. Um, in addition to the 144,000 that are preaching the gospel, there are angels in heaven preaching the gospel. There's no excuse at that point. If, you don't, if you're not willing to hear and obey the gospel at that point, when these 144,000 are out there preaching it, and angels from heaven are preaching it, then you need to be in hell. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then there came another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, declaring the destruction of Babylon. And then there came another angel declaring that whosoever will take the mark of the beast in his right hand or in his forehead should be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of his angels. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and take the mark of his name. And then in the second part of the chapter, we see this vision that John saw of the Son of Man reaping those who were left on the earth who were righteous, who, who finally heard the word of God during all these events that we read about in the first part of the chapter. And they washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made themselves clean. And then after the Lord Jesus Christ did that, and we see another angel casting his sickle into the earth and gathering the, the wicked of the earth and throwing them into the winepress. And this is the wrath of the Almighty God which will come down upon the ungodly of this world who were so bold in their darkness and their stupidity and their wickedness as to reject every piece of evidence and to reject every form of intelligence and every form of godliness and to cleave with all their might to the darkness and their folly. And the wrath of God will come down upon them and that's what we read about in the second Part of that vision in Revelation chapter 14. So I hope these things have been a blessing to you and encouragement to you. I hope that you have received understanding. And may the Lord give you revelation of these things in Jesus' name, because I can teach you about these things and help you to understand, but only the Lord Jesus Christ can reveal these things to you. So if there's things that you don't understand, before you write to me and ask me all kinds of questions, please take some time to pray to the Lord about it and ask him. And I would venture a guess that he will reveal to you a lot of the things that you were probably just about to ask me about. And if after that you still have questions, write to me. I'm here for you. My email address is at the bottom of, of this video and at all my videos now because Google Plus has taken over YouTube so that I can't answer or, or uh, receive or, or monitor any of my comments anymore. So you can't comment on my videos anymore, but you can still communicate with me through uh, my email address, which is sort of the valiant ones at gmail.com. So I remain here for you and I hope to continue this series soon. 
peace to you in Jesus' name, those of you who are in this precious body of Christ. And to those of you who are not in the body of Christ, the time is running short. There's no more time to play games. Come to Jesus Christ. Today is the day of salvation.